when we are just living our Christian life or serving others in the area of leadership or even in prayer one for another, we, <clears throat> we often run into what I call the, the challenge of misplaced certainties. Misplaced certainties. In other words, we're, we're very certain about some things. <clears throat> we think they're absolutely going to happen. And then they don't. Or we're absolutely certain something's not going to happen, and then it does. And we can't figure out why. One of the clearest um, New Testament examples of this is, is Mary and Martha, who I talk about in length in another message from John chapter 11 and the sickness and then death of their brother Lazarus. And they're not worried at all. In, in verse 3, I believe it is, we see the prayer they send to Jesus Lord, the one whom you love is sick. And it's such a simple prayer full of trust. And they are absolutely convinced that Jesus is going to come and heal their brother. So convinced they don't even ask him to. I mean, why should they ask him? He loves their brother. And he will come and heal them. They're convinced. And then Jesus doesn't. And they go into shock. And the reason I say this is because from the text... Um, when Jesus comes to, to Bethany, finally, four days late, he, he is met with a very angry Martha. We know this because she doesn't greet him, which in that culture is unthinkable, not to greet your distinguished older teacher relative. Some people think Jesus was a relative. She just says, Lord, if you had been here, the one whom you love, my brother would not have died, she says. Excuse me. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Just a public rebuke thrown in his face like a slap. Well, the, the problem they had was that they came up with a, a wonderful prayer, really. It was biblical. It was based on their relationship with Jesus. It was based on his character, which was a character of love, and based on their experience of him that he was a healer, that he did heal, that he loved healing people. So it, it, it was just, it was, a, it was a very biblical, wonderful prayer. It was full of trust. There was only one problem with it. It wasn't what God wanted to do. And they didn't really put their trust in Jesus. They put their trust in what they wanted him to do which was come immediately and heal their brother. And for reasons which I get into in the longer message that was not about what Jesus was going to do, so their brother died and they went into shock and insulted him publicly. Mary, a few minutes later, did the same thing publicly. Same phrase, word for word. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. There's a difference between putting our trust in Jesus and putting our trust in what our plan is for him to do in our, on, according to our timetable. These ladies had a, a plan and a timetable. Nothing wrong with it, except that it wasn't God's. So their trust was not in Jesus. If their trust had been in Jesus, they would not have buried their brother. And it's when Jesus asked them where their brother was, and they showed him the tomb over there with a stone rolled against it, that he wept because he realized that they had not been able to, they had not ever had their trust in him. They had not been able to, to wait to keep that trust in him. They just gave up and buried their brother. Jesus wept. How often does he weep over us and our misplaced certainties. This works out in all kinds of ways. There's a, a very common expression in the English-speaking church, and it goes like this. Oh, God is in control. And this expression is used to excuse all kinds of sin and 
and bad things happening. And it's usually said with an air of finality and even passivity. God is in control. And the way it's used, especially these recent years, is just like Inshallah. It's just like Muslim theology. No difference. Oh well, God is in control. It connotes a, a kind of a, a resignation in the face of the incomprehensible. Which, which is okay, which I understand completely. But we, we need to get a grip on, on some certainties that we do know from Scripture that we, we tend to forget all too, all too easily. One is that we live in a fallen world. And it is a world full of sin, full of bad things happening to good people. And it is a world which God decided not to control from the very beginning. For one fundamentally profound and good reason, and that is there is no control in love. There cannot be any control in love. If there's control, it's not love. If there's love, it's not control. Comenius, the great Christian educator from what's now the Czech Republic, was the one who first stated things in this way, talking about Christian education. And for too many people, Christian education consists of controlling kids and making them do exactly what you want to do. There could be nothing further than the truth. Some people even teach in America that God determines the movement of every molecule. I read a post on Facebook after that horrible tsunami in Japan. Uh, well, that was a judgment on Japan because God controls the movement of every molecule, so every molecule of every wave was directed by God to destroy those cities and all those people. Oh. I think that the Bible is very clear that God's will is not being done all the time and everywhere. As a matter of fact, the Bible, it seems to me from the third chapter on, is a record of God's will not being done. And then God working still with that rebellion and, and the consequences of those sins and selfishness in order to bring to bring uh, good out of evil because he is our Redeemer and we can say our Redeemer lives. One place where God is in control is that he decides. <laughs> and this is another one of our misplaced certainties. We think we can manipulate God through praying a certain way or praying with a certain weight or repetition that he will have to answer our prayer. I was teaching on faith just recently and someone said, you mean I can't just claim things? In other words, I can't just say loud enough and often enough that this is what I want. I claim it by faith, I claim it by faith, I claim it by faith, and then God will have to give it to me? I said, that's exactly what it means. That's nowhere in scripture. Do you see people repeating the same prayer hundreds and thousands of times in Scripture at the top of their voice and then God saying, okay, okay, you convince me. That is nowhere in Scripture. But we have thousands of people, at least around the world, thinking that's what faith is. I put some of these thoughts together when a whole lot of people had a misplaced certainty that God was going to heal my wife when she got deathly ill of a disease for which there is no cure and no known survivor. Um, but the Lord, in his sovereign will, decided not to heal her. And he was very good to both my son and me telling us although we were still on different continents, telling us he was not going to heal her. But she, 
she had so many friends and everyone in our mission knew her father, co-founder of the University of the Nations. A lot of people knew me, they knew her. And then we had all these friends in French-speaking Europe and other European nations. There were literally thousands of people praying for her healing. Quite literally thousands. And churches of several hundred people were praying for her and never even met her. So there was quite a mobilization of prayer. And I came to realize just after she passed on that there was enough prayer for the Lord to have healed her. And there is a, a weight to prayer. And this is why we do prayer chains, for example. And this is why we will remind God of a, of a long-standing prayer. Especially for the salvation of a loved one, for example. So there is, it's true that there is a weight to prayer. But no matter what the weight, that, that prayer does not obligate God to do anything. He is God. And we must be sure of that before trying to put into place any other certainties. I think that the, the explanation for things like that Japanese tsunami and, and various other calamities, terrible storms, terrible earthquakes, and <coughs> fires and all that kind of stuff, is the violence in creation that came in at the moment of the fall. And Romans 8 tells us that all of creation is groaning and suffering, waiting for our redemption, waiting till we get it as the children of God. But there is a, a violence in the, in the fundament of creation, in the, in the heavens, in the, in the tectonic plates pushing together um, that form the mountains and, and give us the earthquakes and all that. There, there's a violence in the weather that was not there in Eden. And so that's part of, of what's going on just in our world. There are, there are times when one molecule on one strand of DNA will go out of control and a terrible disease will get going, um, which is what happened with my wife. <coughs> because we live in a fallen world. Now, the Bible says, it does not say God is in control, because the way we say that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does say in Psalm 103, 19, God's sovereignty rules over all. His sovereignty is over all. In some translations, it's his reign is over all things. So what does that mean exactly? He's not controlling everything because there are sins. There are terrible things being done to individuals every microsecond of the day. There are terrible things being done to entire populations, such as the population of, of North Korea, the population of South Sudan. We could go down the list. So he's not control, controlling everything, but... His sovereignty is overall. How does that work? Here are some thoughts that I um, that I'll share. I started thinking about these in 1974 with our teaching from from Lauren, especially <coughs> on how God works. And this is important for us to think about because. Also in, in Psalm 103, we had this challenge coming to us over and over again from Joy Dawson back then. From verse 7, 
where God made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the sons of Israel. And her challenge was this. Are you going to be satisfied with seeing the acts of God? In other words, seeing God do great things, answering prayer, doing miracles? Or are you going to want to find out, like Moses, his ways? Why he does things? Why he doesn't do others? And I think we're living in a time when many people want to see the acts of God. They want to see miracles. They're praying for healings. Their ambition is to see people raised from the dead. Which, of course, is all good stuff. But, but how many want to really seek out the ways of God? how he works in the nations. What is he up to in times of, of war, for example? When nations go to war and, and their, their population suffering and moving, and what is God up to? Where is he in all that? I think the Bible gives us certain indications. There is uh, an illustration that Lauren used during our school in 74. And we'll put a, a graphic up there so you can see it as I talk about it. God's plan in history can be illustrated as a river. In other words, there's a river there. God started the river with a spring and it flows. It's got banks all the way down. And it flows and it empties into a sea. And human history is like that. God started it. He got it going. He has determined how it's going to end. He's already written the last chapters. We have those chapters. And he keeps human history within certain limits, like the banks on that river. So... As individuals, we are swimming around out in the middle of that river. We can go with God's flow. We can try to fight against the flow of God. We can swim around out in circles, out in circles out in the middle of the river if we want to. But the river is still going to go to where God has decided it's going to go. And it's going to stay within his, its banks. God's river does not leave the banks. And, and, and that's how we can look at human history. Individuals are free to act however they want to. They can obey God and, or disobey God or whatever. But that's not going to stop God's purposes from finally being accomplished. And what we see in the Bible is exactly that. We see his purposes always being accomplished even if key people disobey at certain points. David disobeyed at some very crucial points in his life. Solomon disobeyed. The only one who never disobeyed was Jesus. Peter disobeyed at a very crucial point in his life. But the Lord restored him, forgave his, his denial, and restored him not just to fellowship, but to leadership. So the Lord is, is a redeemer. He can redeem all this bad stuff going on. God's sovereignty in, in the affairs of nations for me means that, and Winky Prattney was another one who taught us this, um, when the destiny of a nation is at stake, he reserves the right to overrule the choice of a king the choice of a ruler of a nation. Not about his personal sovereignty, his personal salvation. But when it comes to the direction of the nation, God will step in and say, okay, I'm changing things. For example, in uh, Ezra 1 verse 1, it says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to allow the Israelites to leave the exile. And it wasn't just because you read in some commentaries, oh yes, Cy Cy uh, the Cyrus had this, this policy of population resettlement. Yeah, it was because God stirred up his spirit. There was an overruling of God in the natural human tendency to 
selfishness on the part of this all-powerful king, God stirred up his spirit so he would let his people go. It says in Daniel chapter 4 that he will remove kings and establish other kings. In Exodus 10, we read of him overruling the decisions of Pharaoh so that the judgment will be complete. The testimony of God's power will go out all over Egypt as well as the people of God, but all over Egypt and to the nations round about, which we read did happen in Exodus 10. So the Lord, to keep human history within its banks, will overrule certain decisions of, head of state, heads of state. This is how I interpret the fact that we haven't had a nuclear war. No nuclear weapons have been set off since 1945. It's not because of the wisdom of the various leaders who had the authority to push that button. It's because of God's sovereignty and his plan uh, to not let the nations blow each other up unless and until they came to that place when judgment was necessary. We prayed often in those early years, um, Proverbs 21 verse 1, this principle which is so important in our intercession for the nations. Proverbs 21 verse 1. The heart of the king is like the channel of water in the hand of the Lord. He can turn it wherever he wishes. And this Hebrew word for channel of water, it's like the water that comes out of a tap in a sink. So you can put your hand under that channel of water and turn it wherever you wish in the sink. That's what the heart of a king is like for God. He can turn it. He can change the decision. I think one... One clear example of that happening was right at the time when Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States, we had had hostages, Americans held hostage by the Iranians for I think it was 444 days, wasn't it? And there's nothing that the previous president could do to get them free. And when Ronald Reagan was elected, the heart of those rulers over Iran changed and they let, the, they let the hostages go. When it would have been in their interest to keep them there. So I think when it comes to nations, this illustration of the river can be very helpful. Let me give you another one, which is maybe a bit more difficult to uh, understand, but don't worry about the example. If you don't get the example, you can certainly get the principle. There, uh, there's this, this principle called the bell curve, which is the basis of statistics and also probability theory. And there's a, you can, you can uh, put in the search box on YouTube, Galton box, G-A-L-T-O-N, and it was, um, Galton was the English guy who first made one of these boxes. And it's also called Q-U-I-N-Q-U-X, I believe, the Kankooks. Anyway, um, we'll put the reference up there for you. But here's the, here's the idea. You get a box, and people make these for science fairs, and they're all kind of... Uh, nerds on the web who've made their own and they're showing you their golden box. So you get a wooden box and you put a whole bunch of nails in. Regularly spaced nails. Okay? And there's a funnel in the box that goes down, at the funnel at the top, and then uh, into the funnel you put a whole bunch of round balls like marbles or ball bearings or whatever. All the same size. A thousand of them. You have to have a thousand. So this box is big enough to hold a thousand balls that are going to all come through that one funnel and bounce on one nail. When they bounce on that nail, there's a 50-50 chance of it going right or left. Then it goes down to the next nail, and there's a 50-50 chance of going right or left. Next nail, next nail, next nail. There's, there's all these rows of nails. So each ball will hit different nails, I don't know, 10, 12, 20 times, depending on the size of the box. 
The bigger the box, the more accurate the results. If you use less than a thousand balls, your results are not going to be very good. Anyway, when you let those balls fall randomly, there's no control, you've built the box most exactly that you can, the balls will fall into, when they come through the funnel and hit all the, all the nails, they'll fall into a bell-shaped curve, like this. Just a beautiful bell-shaped curve. And that is the, um, the principle that the behavior of an individual cannot be predicted at all. Nobody knows what an individual is going to do. But if you take a random sample of a thousand individuals from a nation, you can be very sure of what they're going to do. This is why when you read in poll results, um, in your nation, they've taken a poll about a certain question, maybe it's a politician, maybe it's about a law, maybe it can be about anything. They take a poll, it's always a thousand people. And they can tell you what the nation is thinking. If, if they chose those thousand people randomly, then the result is certain. Now the mistake they often make in the media is they don't choose them randomly. For example, exit polls in an election. We recently had here last month the English voted to leave the European Union. Well, the polls said they wouldn't leave, but those were not scientifically accurate polls. They were, and throughout the day of the vote even, they got it wrong because they were asking the people who left the voting booth, how did you vote? That's not scientific. And it's very well known by now that people often give the wrong answer. They will not tell that guy, that reporter, how they voted. They'll tell them the opposite. So a lot of people that day, all day long, they were saying, oh yeah, I voted that we should stay in the European Union. And they didn't. <laughs> so the sample was not random. So in where I live here in Switzerland, they, they'll interview a thousand people to know what the nation is thinking. In America, with dozens of times the population, it's still a thousand people. It's this creation principle that um, the nation, the whole, can be predicted. The whole is sure, but the individual is not. In other words, we can say it another way. The unity is determined, the diversity is free. The unity is determined, the diversity is free. Lawrence said it like this concerning predestination and free will. And I don't like the term free will because it's not in the Bible. And we are not completely free, ever. We have all kinds of influences upon us. However, as Francis Schaeffer said, he refused to use the term free will, but he said we are responsible before God. And Lawrence said it this way, if you look at predestination in the New Testament, the word is used five times, and each of those uses refers to the church. The predestination of the church is to be transformed into the image of Christ. But we take that those passages and others, including the, the one from Romans where it says, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, and we say, oh, that's about individuals. No, it's not. It's very clear in the text that it's about two nations, Israel, Jacob, and Edom, which is called Esau. Throughout scripture, the nations are called by individuals because the Lord sees the nations as an individual. But the nations have a destiny that has nothing necessarily to do with the, the destiny of the individuals making up that nation. So in predestination, it, uh, it applies to the church and that is our destiny, that will happen, that is sure and certain and decided. But the, the individual decision as to who gets to be part of the church and who will be transformed into the image of God, that is 
an individual decision. And that's how this works out. The individual is free, whether it's the molecule of water in the river, the bouncing steel ball in the Galton box, or the, the human being faced with an evangelist who has to decide on their eternal salvation, the individual is free to choose. But the overall is in God's hand. In other words, his sovereignty is over all. He has established his throne in the heavens, as the first part of that verse says, Psalm 103, 19. So, we can take a poll of a nation, if we get our thousand perfectly randomly selected individuals, and there are ways to do this. This is what the statistics people study. And um, every single poll that has gotten it terribly wrong, they know exactly why. It's because they did the interviews in a way that was not random. But we can be certain of what a nation thinks as long as our sample is random. In other words, our certainty is based on randomness. I, th I think that is so cool. Let's take another example. And this one isn't real easy either, but I'm sure you've heard about it, so it's good if we talk about it a bit. It's called the uncertainty principle, as a matter of fact. And it's a guy in 1929 named Werner Heisenberg who brought out this uncertainty principle, which if you want to state it very simply, and, and I have never studied physics, so I'm very simple with this, is that at the subatomic level, in other words, below atoms, uh, particles change into waves and waves change into particles. So if you're trying to look with your electron microscope at a particle, it'll turn into a wave. And if you're looking at a wave, it'll turn into a, a particle. So at that level down there, everything is random. Everything is changing. So in the years after this started to be popularized, some people used it to try to say, well, there's no law in the universe. There's no certainty and there is no God. Because if you look at creation, the, the fundamental building blocks of creation, the subatomic particles, it's all movement. They're nothing solid. There's nothing sure. The waves change into particles and the particles change into waves. But these people conveniently forget that um, that only applies at the subatomic level. At the macro level, in other words, where li we live, um, Newtonian physics still apply. In other words, we can send a satellite on the way to Mars because we know where Mars is going to be a certain number of years from now. Exactly. We know that Halley's Comet returns every 86 years. Exactly. Why? Because at that level, things are sure and certain and determined. At the level of the orbits of the stars, the comets, the planets, and even on our human level, we know that it's, things are not random. We know that if we step off a roof, we're going to fall straight down and crash. Because at that level, things are certain and sure. It is only at the subatomic level that matter moves around like that. So the, the planets are, they're determined in their orbits. Now they're made up of rock and gases, which are made up of molecules, which are made up of atoms, which are made up of subatomic um, particles. So at the subatomic level in those planets, everything is random. Nothing can be predicted, not the position of the particle, not even whether it's going to be a particle. It's all random. But <laughs> those random particles make up the atoms and the molecules and the rocks and the gases, and the orbit of that planet is absolutely fixed. The certainty of that planetary orbit is based on randomness. God's certainty is built on uncertainties. Therefore, he is not threatened by uncertainty. OK? 
because he created this, this uh, universe, this world, with no need to control everything. He created systems which function. And the reason, as we said in the beginning, is that he created, he created us, he created this world for love. And love is built on risk. If there's no risk, there's no love. So he had a choice. He had already done one risky creation. Let's not forget. He had created the angels. We don't know when. We don't know how many. But he created them spiritual beings, not physical like us, but like us in the sense that they had this terrible, in the original sense of the word, Terrible capacity to choose between responsibility and irresponsibility, right and wrong, submission and rebellion. That was risky to create beings like that. Especially the one most beautiful one he created named Lucifer. And one third of them decided to follow Lucifer in his rebellion. And the Lord, he had that example before him, very clearly before him, when he decided to create us. Some time later. How many centuries, how many eons, how many ages, we do not know. But he decided to take the same risk because he is a God of love. He is love. This describes who he is. He is love. So he could have set up a creation where everything was under perfect control. No randomness, everything cause and effect, everything turned out exactly like you want, wanted. It'd be kind of like building an electric train, only much more complex. Which is cool in a way, but it doesn't take much creativity when you get right down to it. Because that electric train, I love electric trains, but it's going to do exactly what you program it to do. It can never do anything different than what you tell it to do. God created humans in the riskiest thing he ever did. Because we could follow him and bring joy to his heart or rebel against him and break his heart again. We sometimes organize our lives to try to eliminate risk so that we don't really need God. And we do this with our finances. We do this by avoiding risky relationships that could lead us into real love. Some of us have been hurt in love, so badly hurt that we don't even want to try relationships again, which is, which is understandable. But I think we need to follow the example of the Lord, and that is to, to risk again. Knowing that there's going to be hurt, there's going to be failures. And this is the whole thing with, with going to church, with Christian organizations, with missions. Why do we have so many missions that are essentially mom and pop missions? They're one couple with maybe their kids. In, the, in North America, most of our missions are one family. And they, they have this fantastic name and this beautiful website. And you drill down and you find out it's one family. Because they can't work with anyone else. They can't risk. And it's risky trying to work with other people. It's messy. It leads to problems. The thing about the 2008 uh, financial crisis is that it was based on an effort to eliminate risk from investing. Uh, one third of all the graduates in theoretical mathematics of, of France work in either uh, the city of London or Wall Street in New York City. 
These are literally the math geniuses of the world. They are the smartest people in the world when it comes to math. But they're foolish because they don't believe in God and their minds are darkened. What they came up with was what they thought was a way of eliminating risk. And they actually announced this. They said, we have succeeded in eliminating risk from investing. And some of you know that what they did was they took all the mortgages they could find and instead of one mortgage staying with one bank and you know which bank had the mortgage on your house, they destroyed the concept of property rights and transmission of property, which has been the foundation of the prosperity of the West. They took all the mortgages, sliced them up like sausages, shuffled them around, repackaged them and sold them around the world. So that it came, when it came to a house in America that defaulted, Nobody knew which bank owned the thing. And they couldn't sell that house for years because it was owned by some bank somewhere and no one could figure out who. They'd done such a good job chopping up the mortgages and selling bits of them in different packages. If that sounds complicated, it is. If it sounds stupid, it's incredibly stupid because nobody can admit risk, can, can eliminate risk. If someone tells you that they have found a way to invest your money which will guarantee you 15% returns with no risk, they are either stupid or a crook. And you should run in the opposite direction in any case. But time and time again, every few years we have good Christians buying into these kinds of d d uh, investment schemes, which turned out to be Ponzi schemes, because they, they believe some guy who says he can eliminate risk. Nonsense. Risk is built into the very fabric of creation. The very subatomic particles of everything we touch and do and eat and sit on, it's all randomness. But we still can be sure of many things, notably of God himself, of his character, and of, of his love. And even though we see random things happening around us, bizarre accidents, freakish weather, all of a sudden a very moral person spirals off into sin, this one cell that can go haywire in a human body, and there's some growth or some cancer that just takes their life in a matter of weeks or months. There is randomness. There is evil. There is sin. But we should not be surprised. That's the way the world is. It got much worse with Genesis 3. God had built the randomness into creation before then, but it was much more manageable and much more benevolent. It turned evil after Genesis 3 only. Our role in this, in this very randomness and outcroppings of evil around us, is to be stewards of all creation. So many passages which tell us this. I love the one in Psalm 8, verses 3 through 8. We are the ones given the authority by God to steward his creation even though all this stuff is going on. And there's a great joy in be able, being able to do that. I do it at a couple different levels. One is my garden where I have the responsibility for 200 square meters of YWAM land. And I got to deal with a whole lot of random events. I have a deer decided to use one corner of one of my flower beds to come and rest every night. Which was very friendly, but I can't grow flowers in that bed anymore. <laughs> so I've decided just to make it a, a place of blessing for the deer. I have weasels, which do a whole lot more damage. They've broken off several of my grape canes that had fruit on them already. Green fruit. 
but that's part of my stewardship and part of the challenges and the joy of, of seeing the, the order and beauty and abundance that can come forth in God's creation when there is good stewardship. And the other area of my stewardship for the last 15 years has been as provost of the University of the Nations where we work, we, our courses are all embedded in wild and wonderful YWAM bases where we have the most decentralized and creative and diverse organization on the planet. And yet we have a university in that. Let me tell you, there are a lot of random things that go on between YWAM and the University of the Nations. But being part of the team that stewards this has been a great joy and fulfillment to me. It's a challenge, but we see on every hand and every day the Lord's presence with us. A major part of this stewardship is intercession. We are intercessors for the advance of the kingdom of God. This is why we are told to pray every day. May your will be done on earth. On earth. Right here. Right where you are as it is in heaven. A little book that used to be required reading for all of us is called Destined for the Throne by Paul Bilheimer. You can usually find an old copy floating around Amazon. He has done the Bible study on the role of prayer that we have received in order to prepare us for the eventual redemption of the kingdom and the restoration of all things. I'd encourage you to, to read that book and to meditate on, the, on your particular, your personal role in the stewardship of the very randomness, the joyful randomness of YWAM, the more pernicious randomness of evil that we see here and there around us. And to ask God to show you how your ministry works in all that. We share in the very authority of the risen Lord. That's what he told us in Matthew 28. He says, I have received authority all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you go and disciple the nations and teach them. So we are part of his plan for extending his sovereignty over all things. But he's not going to do it by himself. He's not going to do it only with angels. He has decided, his sovereign decision is to use us I'm not always sure it's such a good idea, especially on certain days. But that was his decision. He did not ask my opinion. So I'll go along with that, with that decision and keep asking him for his help day in and day out in my little corner of his creation. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for your unsearchable ways, for your ability to to deal with randomness, to deal even with sin, to deal with a human population where most of the people have decided not to follow you. You are still with us. You are still over us. You are still guiding us. You are still our God. You're amazing. And show each and every one of us how, how we can work with you as your, as your children, your beloved children working in the business of their father. Amen.